So it, it, it made me uh, think about this question. So how, how, do, how do all of your systems stay relevant when all of you know, because you see it in your kids, they've got devices, we've got all of this sort of teaching and learning opportunity up in the cloud. How do you, how do you stay relevant? In order to stay relevant, you know, you have to be willing to take risks. And we have a superintendent, um, Dr. Duncan Klusman, who we're very fortunate, those of us who work in Spring Branch, that he is very willing to take, um, to take risks and get outside the box. And so we're not afraid to step out there and try something new because we know that if it doesn't work or if it fails, which is real likely, the first time you, you know, that you try something, that he's okay with that. And um, he pushes our thinking, and in turn, we, we push each other's thinking. So I, I think the first step in that process is to, to be open to taking risks and not be afraid to fail, and don't be afraid to ask the questions that uh, you, you need to ask and, and work with, with others um, around you. I think this venue here is a great start for that because I think it's opening the conversation between um, pre-K-12 and higher ed and allowing us to ask some questions that maybe we wouldn't ordinarily ask. So I think it starts with leadership. I totally agree, John Burr, and I think, you know, Kip, we've grown up as a really entrepreneurial organization that's focused on innovation and has consistently rewarded our school leaders and our teachers for innovating, um, using their autonomy to create uh, curricula, to create um, a whole, a whole host of different things in their classrooms and in their schools, and we share, we then share practices. So both the 21 schools in Houston and the 125 schools around the nation, we really believe that we should go off and, um, and, and try new things and see what works and then share it with each other so that we can all get better together. And so it's like we're, we're on a platform and we're all continuing to raise the platform to get, or raise the bar together to get our kids to and through college. Um, and, and one of the innovations that we're really focused on right now is how to integrate blended learning into our classrooms. And so we feel that in order to stay relevant, we need to make sure that our kids are getting the best education possible. And I think what really excites us about blended learning is uh, two things. One, it really allows us to individualize education for our kids. So for us, it's not just about our kids sitting in front of a computer for a certain amount of time or uh, you know, going home and doing Khan Academy or, or whatever. I mean, sure, that's part of it, but what it's really about is individualizing education for every single one of our students so that they can receive instruction on their level and they can be pushed and challenged to get better and to grow, and we can backfill for skill gaps along the way as well. Um, in addition, <laughs> thank you. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we also really love the idea of blended learning because it provides us real-time data on how our students are doing from minute to minute to minute. So uh, we started a new school this year called Kip Courage. I was part of the Sky Partnership in partnership with Spring Branch ISD and Yes Prep. And uh, at Kip Courage, we're, we're piling a lot of blended learning work and we have this learning lab. And there's the Dean of Instruction and the Learning Specialist who sit all day in the Learning Lab. And what they do is they take kids' data as they're using Rosetta Stone, as they're using these other um, Khan Academy and other programs in the Learning Lab, and they're feeding back that data not only to teachers on an immediate basis, but also to the students. So they're using their time to conference with students and say, here's how you did just now. What does that mean for where you need to go, and what do you need to learn, and really engaging students in their learning, and we think that that's going to be the way that we stay relevant. And the last thing I'll add is that what we don't want to lose in all of this um, kind of uh, eagerness to do blended learning and these other things is that great teaching is great teaching. And we're actually only allowing our best teachers to pilot blended learning because we feel like they're the best equipped to innovate and to be creative around what they do. And uh, we never want to lose this balance between Kit being 49% academics and 51% character. Well, that's, that's a perfect setup. Let me, let me just jump right on that. The idea of preparing the right staff to send these ladies, the right educators and the right school leaders, is on our mind here at the University of Houston. Um, 
it would be easy to say that the new generation of teachers, they know technology and they'll be fine and they'll just fit right in, but we find that they don't. They know how to use their cell phone, but they don't know how to use it to learn. They don't know how to evaluate a piece of information that's on the internet. You know, they, we could say we'll send them all to Khan Academy, but they need to know what, what is it about what I'm learning, what is it about me as a learner, and then how does that translate to me as a teacher and how to reach different children. So, you know, I think the caution in the idea of a flipped classroom or blended learning is there's a lot of poor quality out there. So we can't just, look what you said, it, it's got to be our best instructors. We can't just say, well, this is great. I'll just videotape myself and I'll just sleep in the rest of the semester and they'll all just watch me. We've got to have kids, and when I say kids, I'm talking about the big kids that we teach and the little kids that they'll teach. They've got, to under, they've got to know something about how they learn. So our teachers and our school leaders here have to understand themselves as a learner, other learning styles, and then how to best exploit the, what technology affords us. How can we use it to do what, what we can't personally do as well so that we can then use what I do well with the students kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so we have to make some decisions about when it's best to have a live teacher, when it's best to use something, a technology tool, a simulation, a video, and um, that's really where we're headed. It's, so it's how to understand how to evaluate and use the tools that are out there. Would it be fair to say that uh, your shop is, is working on maybe some different coursework, right? Because, you know, one of the things when I went, when I went through my teacher education, I, I was social studies, so I got a social studies education, right? But what I just heard you say is it's not necessarily so much about content, it's more about learning design. It is. Well, I think, it, I, I think it's not, I wouldn't say that it's not about content. It's about how each technology or each mode of teaching or mode of expression benefits each particular content. So I'll use your social studies example. I see some of our social ed faculty here. Yeah. And understanding how best to get across primary documents, primary sources, how best to um, have students interact with something that otherwise might be historical you know, artifact, that makes a difference. And so it's not just a blanket use of technology, it's how does technology help us teach language arts and language learners? How does it help us teach science and record and data? So it, that's important. Yes. Anybody else thinking about experience. relevance? I think we've probably covered the field, but I wanted to add one additional thought that I think, for me, having been in education for over 30 years, I think part of being relevant is having courage, having the courage to look at yourself as a district and say, what are we not doing? And to stop if we are in fact doing it. If we're blaming kids, let's not. If we're blaming the neighborhood, let's not do that either. I mean, if parents aren't coming to parent conferences, then they aren't coming to parent conferences. But that's the way it is. What can we put in place and do things differently? And are we willing to teach differently from the way we were taught? I think we still have lots of, across the country, not just in Houston, I think we have two, far too many teacher-centered centered classrooms. And we talk about student engagement, but I would ask all of you, do you really see that? And we talk about blended learning, but it ends up being really just computers in the back of the room. So it's just another way. It's really the same old thing with computers, and so it sort of misses the boat. So for me, it's all about you know, in life you want introspection is a good thing. So I think as professionals and as, a, and as school districts, we need to be introspective. And I will tell you that, you know, Dr. Greer, who's the superintendent, one of the things that he does, he's one of the most uh, direct people I've ever met in my life. I'm surprised he's from North Carolina. I would have thought he was from New York. Um, he just puts it out there. And, you know, I like that because I like, I think he has the courage in doing that and being able to buck the status quo. Because in a large urban school district, and, you know, Houston ISD is the biggest in the state, one of the biggest in the country, we don't have time to fool around and have polite conversations. We just have to be honest about what's working, honest about what isn't working, and put plans in place and then follow through on them. Sometimes plans are in place. They're good ideas, but there's no accountability. There's no support for teachers who are trying to do things differently. So I think that's a big part of it, too. Do you see greater relevance in your elementary classrooms than you do your secondary classrooms, for the most part? I think we do, but, but uh, we're definitely working on that. Yeah. But I want to add something to the question that, that uh, they just answered. Actually, to her, her one word that she used was courage. Yeah. And you know, 
Courage also means that we have to be able to break through the barriers that are keeping us from providing some of these innovations. For example, how many of us uh, just recently had policies that said we couldn't use cell phones in the classroom? Just recently, just, just recently, I know in Fair we, we removed uh, or changed that policy. So that's a barrier. We need to make sure that we're removing, that, that we're move, we're removing barriers that are set before us by the legislators. The seat time, we've talked about seat time. Our presenter talked about seat time. Well, how will we get credit for seat time if the kids aren't right there sitting in their seat? Those are all barriers that we have to make sure that we're working through and we're, and we're breaking through to make sure that we're providing those, those, uh, those innovations for, um, for our classrooms to provide these types of programs and uh, the blended models. You know, the relevance in, in, in the elementary levels, yes, we, we have them, but is it also because of the setups of the elementary schools? You know, we, we, they're, they're, not, they're not seeing, our teachers aren't seeing 150 or 160 students. They, they basically have their classroom or they have a, a pairing type classroom. So that allows you to also have more connections and relationships with our, with our students. And, and I think that one of the things that we need to make sure that, that we're providing for our, our students that are in education classes is teaching them about what that means. What is relevant? And having them have those experiences with, uh, with relevance, because they've got to know what that means. And they have to, to certainly learn the content, because we certainly have concerns with that, that we need to make sure teachers are coming with, 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 know, with learning the content. <clears throat> but they also need to learn about working with diverse populations, and especially economic, economically disadvantaged kids, and know about relevance. Otherwise, how will they make it relevant? You know, it, it reminds me of when, when, when I was a, a young teacher, and, and, and I still remember this, working, working with one of my students, Claudia, on, on a TOS, and you know, like a wonderful teacher back then doing, doing a, 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 a TOS prep worksheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I remember the, quest, yeah, I remember the question I having, remember having, to do, having to do with popping popcorn and, and, and what caused the what cost popcorn to pop. And I can remember the answer choices. Was it color? Was it heat? Uh, was it the size? You know, of course, the answer is, is heat. But relevance, when we talk about relevance, I immediately went to, because Claudia got the wrong answer, I immediately went to, well, Claudia, you know, when you pop, when you put popcorn in the microwave and it pops, what's causing it to pop? Well, guess what? Claudia didn't have a microwave. She was an economically disadvantaged child. So then I went to the next best thing. Okay, well, forget that, forget the microwave. How about when you pop it on the stove? She didn't have that experience either. What about with the Jiffy Pop? Because you know, I have that experience. No. Well, then I went to the one that I just knew she would, she, she would be able to relate to. What about when you go to a movie? Well, guess what? Claudia had never gone to a movie. So how can I make the instruction relevant if I don't know about my own kids? The so person? Arthur will be. Uh, at, at, at the time that he was leaving as president of uh, Columbia uh, University Teachers College, wrote an article in Ed Week. And, and I'm going to ask you this because you work for one of the high performing charter school systems. And he, what, what, what he said in that article was we think charter schools are the disruption. But actually, charter schools are still inside of the box, only they're farther to the outside of the inside of the box, right? So what is, so if he was wrong and, and charter schools are really outside the box, tell, tell, me, tell me what disruption charter schools are making currently after 20 years. Well, <clears throat> I think we're making a lot of disruption in terms of the debate around charter schools. Um, and I know that um, people have a lot of feelings around whether or not um, charters should grow, whether or not we should expand, whether or not we're doing the same work with the same kids. So I see a major disruption there. And I know that probably everyone in the room has, has their ideas about that. Um, I do see, though, the point that um, 
that you're referring in that we are still incredibly traditional in a lot of ways. And um, part of my presence here today was also to really learn from our keynote speaker and take back some of these ideas to our organization and think about how we can be progressive in the way that we're addressing learning needs as well as we've been progressive in the way that we've designed programs around talent. So when I think about where we have made major changes, it's been in the way we teach teachers, in the way we evaluate teachers, and in the way that we are developing leaders to support teachers. And um, those teachers are truly the drivers of student learning and student change and the, the impact that we're ultimately trying to have, which is to make, a, to make a disruption in the life trajectory of these kids. And not only these kids, but the families in, that they belong to. So um, I think that piece has been an area in which we are very controversial and we are trying to really push the envelope in terms of the way that we think that teachers should be developed and the ways that we think that teachers' um, career trajectories should go. Um, in terms of being less, more, I'm sorry, more similar, um, I see many opportunities, with, especially within Yes Prep, for us to envision a different world for kids. Um, we, are, we are a highly structured environment in a lot of ways for our students because we do believe that in certain structured environments, students are able to learn and focus more on what, on what, what it is ahead of them. Um, when we think about the ways that we want to experiment with kids learning, I think it's really pushing beyond certain aspects of content into the ways that our students think. Um, I'm really excited about what we're talking about today because um, it's a follow-up to professional learning experience I had last year, which is I got the chance to go to Facebook for a day. Awesome. Um, and um, yeah, all my former students think that I'm very, very special because of that. Um, but I really vowed that I was going to take that. I did something to this. I. Got it, got it, I got it. <laughs> I vowed I was going to take that experience and bring it back to yes. And um, we got a chance to sit down with some of their senior leaders. And I asked them, I'm like, I'm trying to get kids through college. And we want to be sure that they have a chance at, like, like what would you want to see in the students of Yes Prep if they were knocking on your door for a job? And they talked to us about, like, the ability to solve problems, the ability to see projects through, and the non-cognitive skills that we also really have to work on, which is the grittiness to, like, keep trying. And so I'm starting to wonder how those, um, those projects that we're working on around non-cognitive skills around tenacity can be somehow connected to this idea of technology in the classroom um, with um, the ability that it's not only a teacher that's continually pushing a kid like, come on, you can do this, you can do this, but there's also like a way to build in that intrinsic motivation, and I know that, that our speakers today had a lot of thoughts on that too. Yeah. So Nancy, uh, what, what, what about Houston ISD? Uh, and you've been there for a short time, but uh, what, do you see that system as disrupting? Do I see Houston ISD, which yeah. is a huge system of 204,000 kids? You know, I, I think that Dr. Greer, there is no doubt that he's a disruptive force. And yeah, I think it's a disruptive system because he has put in place numerous things that have caused a lot of, um, there's that word, disruption. Well, he, he is work. Yeah, there's sort of an um, understanding that the status quo won't work, that we're very much in a hurry. He always says, used to drive me crazy, um, and I told him that, that you plant the seed in the morning, you water it at noon, and you pick the flower at dinner. And I'd say, dinner time. I'd say, wait a minute, that's not enough time. And he would say, we don't have time. So I think he operates from that perspective, and, and everyone who works for Houston understands that. That's why we have different kinds of um, magnet schools. Um, we have what we call New Hills Academy, so the kids can, by the time they graduate from high school, have two years of college credit under their belt. That's why we have kids who are, we don't have, you know, the gate is not up in terms of AP and dual credit. All kids deserve access, don't they? Just because they were labeled in elementary school as not as smart as someone else, what was that based on? Anyway, um, the doors are open. So any kid who wants to take those high-level courses is allowed to take those high-level courses, if not encouraged. So I think there's a lot of disruption, but it's a very large system. Um, I think it takes some time, and he always says, as I said, we don't have time, let's get going. But I think he's put a lot of things 
in place. Um, we have new charter schools opening up. We have new magnet schools opening up. It's a lot to manage, but I think if you have people for whom teaching is a calling and not just a profession, then you're way ahead of the game there. And if you have people who really think that kids are entrusted to us by their parents, then you have the right, and it's a sacred responsibility, I know it's very old fashioned, showing my Catholic heritage, but I really believe that, then where you're way ahead of the game because you have a group of people with the same vision. And so yes, I think it's disruptive, but we need to be, we need to be more disruptive because we don't have that much time. You know that in Houston, ISD, we have thousands and pop, pop, thousands of kids who are below grade level on reading. Do you know that? And we've been reading, I know all of you have been reading the research that says, good God, if you don't get them on grade level by third grade, don't say never, but what are your chances? And all the research out there that we've been reading, we read research. That's what we're encouraged to do, and that's what we like to do. It says, you know, they're, they're in a very, those kids are in a very bad position. So we've been working with Nighthouse, we've been working with other people for literacy programs in place to say, you know what, these kids are going to be on grade level by third grade, or it's going to be our fault and nobody else's but our fault. Melissa, uh, yes, what sir. type of disruption do you see here in the College of Ed? And understand your boss is sitting right here. Well, he's a, so make, no, make he's that answer good. Reason for some of the disruption that's happening. Well, I mean, as you will, I think most of us will agree. Traditionally, College of Education are very firmly inside the box, right? And it's a fortified, strong box that we're that we're operating within. We have it's all opportunity. I think we see at this point. And I think what, but there's a few things we're trying to do. One is we're trying to learn as much as we can. And part of that is talking to districts and establishing, you know, it really should be a continuum from our preparation of teachers straight out to the schools. We all should be partners and talking the same language and having the same common vision. And then, if you can imagine it, then cycling back into developing good leaders who want to be teachers from the beginning and pulling them back in. We need to learn as much as possible. We certainly learn from the research but we need to be able to, to play with things a little bit. So part of it is understanding kind of how can we be, be disruptive, but within playing with the rules. Because we have a lot of rules around us. We have, we have a state who says, your teachers need to know this, but we have a state that also says, but you need to do it in this many fewer hours. So we need to know how to, how to develop something that's creative. One thing we're looking at now, you know, we very firmly have, you know, butts in seats. They need to be three hours per, per week per class. They need to be 45 clock hours per semester. So we're trying to block courses so that in one semester, rather than having five separate completely different courses that I don't know what you're teaching and I don't know what you're teaching, but I know what I'm teaching, we're trying to say, let's get those courses on a degree plan because we need to, but then how can we look at that whole experience, the whole semester as an experience and look at the space between the courses and get them out to schools more and Yes, they're learning all these things along the way, but they might not be learning it just from me. They might be learning it from somebody at KIPP, or they might be learning it from somebody in the field. So it's it's how to, I think our biggest thing right now is there are rules around us that we need to meet. We need to graduate the kids. We need to make sure that they you know, do everything they need to to follow, to dot all the, the I's and cross the T's, but how can we kind of mess around a little bit within this? So uh, I, I do some adjunct teaching here. and. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, EDD program, uh, executive education. And I was teaching a class uh, in, on the superintendency. And uh, we had a panel of three superintendents. And uh, uh, the, the students were kind of lobbing these softball questions, so I decided uh -huh. you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna launch a, a hardball question to the superintendents. And uh, I asked them, I said, so if you all stay awake at night thinking that you lead outdated systems of learning. And I actually thought they were going to lie to me and say, no, I don't think that at all. But actually, to a superintendent down the line, they said yes. And they said, I'll tell you more. The only reason we're as good, if we are good right now, is because we just work hard. We've got our human base working at top capacity, as hard as they can, and we have maximized it out. Well, Scott, I think part of, of, of the, of the uh, stress of all that comes with 
how do we do we create the disruptions but still have to live within the square that we have to live in because of accountability and because yeah. of the graduation requirements yeah. and, the, and the number of EOCs that are, that are said before us by, by the state. Because we have to deal with those in, 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 in public education. So how do we still deal with, the, with those disruptions? And that, that is something that we're working, we're working uh, on creating disruptions in Cypress Fairbanks. My, my partner, Roy Garcia, is, is back there and, and he's creating a big disrupt, disruption right now with leadership and looking, looking to see what truly is leadership and how do we need to look at it differently as we're selecting principles and principal paths. And that's certainly a huge disruption. You know, we're looking at disruption as well as how do we pro provide more choice for our kids, choice, choice in 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 in, uh, in academies, choice in, in in instruction, just different choices. How do we create those things, but still have to be bound by staying within the square that is said that is said before us by by the legislature? Can I make a comment on it? So, one of my um, one of the questions you we I told that I'd be asked is what keeps me up at night. So that would be millions of things including my own children. But in terms of what happens in the state of Texas, lots of things. And the accountability system really worries me because we're telling teachers to go with blended learning, be innovative, think out of the box, do X, Y, and Z. But yet we also know that high school kids have to pass not 12, but 15 end of course exams. And it's a very dense system. It's very hard to explain to parents. So a kid who is a freshman English could pass the course and get credit, move on to sophomore English, but have failed the test. So now this student in sophomore English has to take two tests at the well during sophomore year. And if that student now, then we have to explain to parents, let's see. You know, you really got a minimum score. Now what does minimum score mean to parents? That suggests the minimum that the student Yes, but actually if you have two years of minimum scores, you're not going to have to have the cumulative score. So think of the bookkeeping, for lack of a better word, that schools have to do nowadays, and think of the confusion on the part of parents. And I feel that it makes them think that we don't know what we're doing. We know what we're doing, but we're asked to do so much that it's just mind-boggling. Yeah. So 15 tests, that's a lot of tests, for sure. especially ELL students who don't, they're given, what, a year, and then they have to take the test? Is that enough? Does the research say it's seven years for real proficiency in a language? So I'm just supporting what you said. I'm Let's go to uh, Nala and then Stephanie. Down the assembly line here of, of the microphone. Um, so there are a couple of areas within Yes Prep where I feel like we are still behind. Um, I would say the first and more of a realization for me today was this direct instruction model where the teacher delivers the material, the kids practice, and then they do it by themselves, and then we take the exit ticket. So um, we have tried to implement a few other aspects of the way that we develop teachers as well as evaluate teachers in how are they like increasing the rigor by, by increasing problem solving and questioning, and I still feel like where teachers feel more control of the classroom is when they're the ones delivering the material. And they're usually also very successful because they've been able to invest the kids to like stay as focused and engaged at that point in time. So I would love to see more like examples of where critical pedagogy is involved and we're starting to get there, yet like the majority of our classrooms are very similar. Last week I actually got to observe one of our most advanced ELA teachers and her entire class was run by students and um, that was, we had um, about 20 instructional leaders doing a full like double block observation and I think there were a lot of like eyes opened in that one experience. So I feel like that we we're trying to break out yet like if you go to any of our schools today you're going to see a lot of teachers delivering that, trying to like gauge interest in questioning from the students yet yet maintaining the significant amount of control. And so I feel like we're, we're working hard to, to push through that. The other is teacher learning beyond year one. So we are very passionate about developing novice teachers. And I sit here with two of my partners um, that we're working on um, 
developing teachers in their novice years. However, like in that second stage teaching, what we're able to offer teachers is very, um, it's not as, I would say, individualized as it needs to be. It's very traditional in terms of a facilitator discussing a topic, providing strategies, people implementing those, and then hopefully improving. And if there's one thing I would love to learn more about, it's like how beyond your beyond your one in that second stage of teaching where you're starting to consider whether or not this is the life path for you, that we have learning opportunities that are engaging and that create the teachers that are going to stay over time and continue to push our kids. Sally, give us the last word, then we're going to go to the audience. Sounds good. Lots of pressure. Final word. <laughs> um, so I, I should start by saying that I was uh, the teacher who, uh, when I was doing supposed to be doing task worksheets, as you talked about with my students, was the one disrupting class and having my kids uh, do something else instead and got written up for that. <laughs> I think I started disrupting things early in my career. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Good job. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, my biggest fear is uh, that we that we lose our ability as we grow to stay nimble and to disrupt ourselves. Because ultimately, having been with Kit for now, this is my 11th year, I've seen an incredible amount of change from the time that we started to where we are today. And so, my biggest fear for us as an organization is that we lose our nimbleness. And uh, there are two things that I want to talk about related to that. I mean, one way I think that we're trying to disrupt ourselves and trying to disrupt the world of education is by being really forthright, forthright about our college graduation numbers. So we track kids all the way from when they enter KIPP in pre-K um, all the way through college. And what we measure ourselves on is how many of our eighth graders, eighth graders, not seniors, how many of our eighth graders graduate from college? And our goal, our aspiration, is that number is the same as the number for the highest income quartile of students in the United States, which is about 82%, right? Somewhere between 75 and 82%. Right now, in the United States, 8% of low-income kids graduate from college. That's mind-boggling. Our college graduation rate is 45%. 45% of our eighth graders graduate from college. And while we can celebrate that that's five times the, the rate for low-income kids, that is not nearly where we want to be. And so what are we doing to disrupt the way that we teach on a daily basis, on the way that we operate, so that we can reach our aspiration? And that's how we think about it. And the second thing I'll say is one of the things we're learning in trying to push that college graduation rate is that, again, academics plus character education. And what we're learning is, you know, we used to be very compliance driven. Our kids would stand in straight lines, they would enter class, they would sit down, we'd do direct instruction. We don't believe that that's the way to teach kids anymore. And that's because we had teachers who would disrupt that, try something different, and we started to learn from it. We actually believe, and we talk a lot about Barty Seligman's um, 24 character strengths, and we focus a lot on grit and curiosity. They're, they're kind of the only eight uh, character strengths. Uh, zest, these other things love that we think actually really make a big difference in our kids' ability to graduate from college and be successful in life. And so that's one of our newest disruptions. We're coming out with a character growth card, which is a way to bear, not only measure character, but we're figuring out ways to teach character in a very deliberate way. So I hope that we continue to disrupt ourselves. I have complete respect for all of you, but again, the answers were all top down, and I want to represent the teachers who were the bottom up. When I first came here and I saw disruption, I thought, great, a, a, a seminar on kids who are causing commotion in the classroom. Yes, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> Not my problem anymore, but I'm sure it's everybody else's. So you said, you know, we have to be proactive and disruptive in ourselves and teach zest. And the state is working so hard at standardizing our test scores. And our leadership is pushing so hard on my colleagues to get those scores up and to get those scores up. It's gotten farther from the teacher and the child than anything. 
one of the things that you brought up were all the, the cheese, the Swiss cheese concept, all the holes. Well, you passed it, your score was good, or you went to summer school, or you did a credit recovery. So from the bottom down, the teacher, the core, the elephant in the room, what are we doing for HISD or within this community from the bottom up to cause a disruption of an improvement? And I'm not talking about how many kids, what are the statistics of college graduates? Because I know a lot of college graduates that can't find jobs. So that statistic, you know, in our classrooms is a mute point. One of the things I love you showed in the slide is they have cubicles and they decorate it with the job that they that is, So what's the role of the teacher in all of this? How do we empower teachers? Because probably since I've been in Texas, we've pretty much trained our teachers to do exactly what the accountability system wanted them to do. And they are well trained now, but now the game's changed. Right? Yes. So how, 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 do you, how do you get teachers out of sort of that fear box? So when I look in a classroom, I think about, is this good enough for Chris Blaine? Because if it's not, it's not good enough for anybody else's kid too. Um, so you, I'm going to couple this with what, what keeps you up at, what keeps me up at night. What yeah. keeps me up at night, and I, I hope this speaks to what you're asking, we have to empower our teachers. The, the teachers are closest to the action in the classroom. And so we have to empower our teachers to do the right thing. And we have to create environments where teachers feel the autonomy to do that. And that goes back to my first, the answer that I, question you asked first when I said I think that goes back to leadership. I didn't mean that to imply that the leader has all the answers. My point is, is that, and I believe in our district, um, we're, we're, we're trying to get there because um, our leader says that where, the, where the, no, the knowledge and the action needs to happen in the classroom. So it shouldn't be top down. It should be, it should be from the ground up. And so I want a teacher in my child's classroom to teach him to be self-determined, to teach him to want to learn, to have the thirst for learning. And you talked about you, visit, you visited Facebook and what they said they wanted. So cre critical thinkers and creative problem solvers, kids get that can think on their own. And so I don't have the answer to how that happens, but I will tell you it is not central office pushing a bunch of curriculum down on teachers um, and telling them exactly what to say and do in the classroom every day. And this is why we have uh, we have a, you talked about the S model, and I wrote it down because we just put a new, we had major budget um, cuts in the state of Texas, just like every other state did, and it caused us to lose $33 million in Spring Branch two years ago. So we could have, um, we could have sat and cried and pouted and been upset about it, but instead what we did was we totally disrupted the system. We cut 350 positions out, many of which were mine in curriculum and instruction. We created a ground up philosophical approach to how we were going to um, work with teachers, develop teachers, and we haven't arrived, mind you, um, but we're still working on it. But these instructional coaches sitting out here in the audience that are in Spring Branch are here to learn how they can be a part of um, teachers creating self-determined learners in the classroom. So I don't think it should come from the top, to your point. It's got to be from the ground up. We have to, we have to teach our teachers to um, develop that in our kids. And so what keeps me up at night as an educator and parent is, is that. So very briefly, um, so I respectfully disagree with you that college graduation is not important. I actually do think it's very important for making sure our kids have choice in their career and that they are career ready. Um, beyond that, I'll just say, you know, for us, we are all about our teachers. Um, autonomy for us starts with our teachers and our school leaders. And so, uh, you know, we just power to lead, right? Power to lead. Uh, we don't want to handicap our teachers and our school leaders by, you know, giving them a bunch of things that they absolutely have to do. Rather, we really want to open it up because they are the people who are going to innovate and be the most creative, and we want to give them the room to do that. And so, for us, at, at the administration, it's about how can we move out of the way and give teachers the freedom to innovate and to create. Um, and, and, you know, when we take, take the same state tests as everyone else does, but I don't think that's handicapping. I think that we can absolutely, within, you know, we're going to teach the state standards. We're going to infuse other standards like the common core that we think are really important. 
Um, but, and, and within that, how do we make sure that our teachers have complete freedom to innovate and be held accountable for their results on a variety of different measures, including the state test, but also including tests like the MAP, uh, the measurement for academic skills. So I think there are ways to do it. But I'm wondering what you're doing about team building among teachers themselves. Um, I, I think that uh, all of this can be done, but it's going to take a team of third grade teachers who are working together, a team of fourth grade teachers, a team of fifth grade teachers. Um, and so as I see my daughter and the things she's facing, um, she wants to be creative, yet she doesn't have peers who yeah. think that together they can succeed so better than How, them. within a college of education, are you starting to build that training and capacity around working as a team? So, one of the things we implemented this, this past fall, this last semester, we, we implemented several um, pretty exciting changes, but one of them was cohorting our students so that they take their classes as a chunk, so that they learn to learn together, they take things together, they, they see each other in every class. So they begin to develop that sense of cohesiveness. As they progress through the program, they work in professional learning communities just like teachers out in the schools do, and we try to coach them into how to work with the group. Because when I present to them, in this semester we're going to learn how to work in groups, you've got half of them that say, oh, I hate being in a group because, you know, I always end up with doing all the load of the work. And, and then the other half that says, great, because we can just hang out and chat. So we coach them into how do, you, how do you work in a professional learning community for professional purposes? How do you look at data together? It's not just talking about what are we doing this weekend, but really how do, you, how do teachers do the work of teaching and, and understanding children, but together as a group. So that's where we are now. So they, they leave this program understanding that teachers work together and it's for real purposes. So I love your question. I think that's a fantastic question because um, of the importance that it plays in the role of great schools and great teacher teams, as well as the role it plays for our teachers who um, believe that there may be other like career aspirations that they want to pursue. So um, in the Teaching Excellence Program that's um, part of the of Yes Prep Public Schools and also serves other systems like Hip Houston um, and Spring Branch and Uplift Education in Dallas, um, all of our teachers actually go through teacher leadership courses during their induction. Um, and those are geared towards them working on the most important leader, which is the teacher leader themselves. And we all know that like that's the hardest leader to coach and manage is the leader that is yourself. And so it starts with um, development around understanding their strengths that they bring to a team and that they're bringing to their school based on the Strength Finders 2.0. The second piece of that is understanding their levels of emotional intelligence, specifically around self-awareness. To understand, like, here's what I'm really awesome at, here are my blind spots and the, and the aspects of my leadership that are going to impact my team. And then finally closes that out with this idea of followership and how, as a teacher, am I creating followership in my students as well as a teacher leader on the ground. Um, at Yes Prep, we've invested in two very specific teams. One is the idea of the grade level team. So at, across all of our schools, each team is led by a grade level chair that is a teacher leader that is driving the vision of that team and the goals that each one of those grade levels has for their kids culturally as well as academically. The second is content level teams. Um, and that is each one of the courses that Yes is led by a course leader that is a teacher in the classroom. And it's incredibly important to us that the people that are delivering the instruction to the kids are the ones creating the resources that other teachers will use. And so being, I, I'd like to add just like one final strategy, which is at the inception of someone's um, coming into our organization, we ask several questions around team. And I, I just love that, that question and this idea because it's not one great classroom that's going to change what we need to change. It's great classrooms across the school and great schools all in one system and a great city like able to make the difference that we need for the kids. Next to our students, the next most important group is the teachers. Because the teachers are the ones that are gonna are, that are gonna make the difference. And yes, we've got to make sure that, that that we are providing the training, that we're building the team, but you also have to make sure that you're providing the opportunities for them to work together. A common planning time. And sometimes that, that's a schedule yeah. nightmare but a common planning time, providing those two opportunities for them. Um, I'm curious because so much disruption and innovation that we hear about is led at the high, from the highest levels of a big system. And with so much change that happens, and we had a question earlier about this constant change in leadership, what examples of innovation can you give us where you've been able to sustain that and grow that 
amidst all this change from your district leadership or the state or other accountability? One of the things that we're doing, talking about teachers, and I really appreciate that question from the Houston teacher about from the ground up, because I think what is happening across the nation is that actually teachers are losing confidence. I think their confidence and their professional ability has is eroding. Not because they're not good teachers, but because the accountability, the data, it's all there for the world to see this great tension. And at least there's some teaching strategies that they might not otherwise use. So what we're trying to do in Houston is, first of all, we're developing what we call career pathways. And we're trying to work on the campuses in collaboration with teachers and leadership teams to really recognize the teacher leaders because the teachers are the ones doing the work. They're the boots on the ground. And we're trying to provide other leadership opportunities for those teachers. I know I was a classroom teacher for 20 years and loved it and never wanted to be anything but that. But I also envision myself doing other things that still impacted kids, not leaving the classroom, but really affected kids' lives. So that's what we're doing with Career Pathways, trying to define roles for teachers on campuses. So they're not leaving the building, they're still teachers, they're still working with teachers, but maybe they have a reduced class row to make them class load, excuse me, or, the, or their coaches, or their meeting and profession, guiding and facilitating professional learning communities. So we're really looking to that. We're also, from the point of view as a curriculum leader here, we're trying to work with, as I said when we first introduced ourselves, having been a classroom teacher, I always honor teachers. I mean, I had the heart of a teacher, and I still do. And those are the people who are the most valuable in any school district. So I, that is why we are working with them from the district level to create everything that we create. So create the curriculum, we work with them. And creating formative assessments, instead of what you were talking about, Michael, that you find out too late that the kids didn't learn. We're working with teachers on that. We're working in cadres with teachers. We're doing focus group with teachers. We're trying to make it so not, not as you were saying, top down, but like a community of people who care deeply who want to get this work done. So I think that has great sustainability, as well as some other projects that okay. I can talk about. But Linda, I you, the you get the final word. <laughs> a, a disruption that, that we implemented some years ago that has continued is a program uh, called PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports. And, and uh, it, it was an, an, interru an interruption, Janet, you will remember that, it truly was. But you know what, it, that, the reason why we've been able to sustain that is because of what this lady asked about regarding teachers, is because it's teacher-led, teacher-driven, teacher decisions. Everything about that program has to do with teacher leadership and teachers leading it. And so one of the great things that's happened from, from, uh, from implementing that program, they, they established their, their, uh, their own systems, they developed their own systems, their own matrix for behavior. And one of the things that has been a great outcome is reducing the number of kids that are standing in line waiting to see the principal, the assistant principal, instead of being in class learning. So uh, I am so impressed with the talent on this panel. Let's give them a big shout out. I'll tell you the person for me that was most relevant during the panel was the AV guy. 